All right, y'all doing things a little bit differently this time. I actually had to script this video. That's right. My thoughts on Goethe's Faust were so extensive that in order to communicate them in any kind of a timely fashion, I had to write them down. So if I seem a little stilted more so in my delivery is because I had to go the Joe Biden route and read off of a script. Let's just hope I can do a better job delivering it than he can. So, Faust by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. The second part and culmination of my two-part Faust project in which I undertook to read both Christopher Marlowe's classic Elizabethan play Dr. Faustus and Goethe's Faust and sort of compare and contrast the two and see what similarities and differences they might have. Uh, because as I said in the review of Dr. Faustus, which you can check out if you would like, uh, the myth of Faust is one of, if not the central myth of the Western world. The concept of selling one's soul for material gain is one that is perennially popular and has penetrated our culture basically to the bedrock. You can see examples of the Faustian myth everywhere, from Robert Johnson, the blues man in real life, to the Marvel Comics character Ghost Rider, to perhaps the greatest Faustian work, Charlie Daniels' is The Devil Went Down to Georgia. The myth of Faust is everywhere. It is all pervasive. And Goethe's work is pretty much the quintessential version of it, as well as one of the supreme achievements of world literature and the supreme achievement of German literature. So a bit of background, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was a German polymath. He really seems to have been able to do a little bit of everything. He was a writer, he was a statesman, he was a scientist, he was a philosopher. He was truly a jack of all trades. In fact, I don't believe that I would be remiss in saying that Goethe perhaps exists in that sphere of elites occupied by the likes of like Leonardo da Vinci, individuals who apparently were geniuses in more than one capacity. Uh, but Faust is Goethe's masterwork, and it took him a lifetime to write. He worked and reworked the story of Faust from his early adulthood all the way until his death in his 80s, and it is widely regarded, as I said, as the greatest work of German literature. Now, I've had to read the first part of Faust in uh, college years ago, and now, after having read the whole thing, I can totally understand why they only make you read part one when you're in school, because damn does part two get wild. So, Faust is written, if you don't know, almost entirely in rhyme, something with which I did take a bit of issue. And it may just be the most famous example of a closet drama. Now, if you don't know what that is, a closet drama is a dramatic work that isn't really meant to be performed. Faust is written as a play, but due to its content and nature, it's almost never performed. In fact, you could probably count on one hand the number of times it has actually been staged in its entirety. So while it may be written in a dramatic form, I think it might be easier to think of it as something more akin to just a very strangely written novel. Uh, the work opens with something of a metafictional prelude involving three characters, a poet, a stage manager, and essentially an actor. Uh, these characters proceed to debate the nature of art and serve for Goethe to illustrate the constraints that artists often face. The stage manager wants the poet to write a work that will make him money, while the actor urges the poet to write a work that people will simply enjoy. The poet, however, desires to write a work of great artistic merit and ambition, even though he is aware that it might fail financially as well as in the eyes of others. It's a sly way for Goethe to comment on the relationship between art and commercialism, and it's similar in effect to uh, a scene in particular uh, from that movie Birdman with Michael Keaton, where the Birdman character tells the main character, that people don't want this boring philosophical crap. They want action and explosions, you know, that kind of thing. 
After the prelude, however, the story proper opens with a prologue which takes place in heaven. And here we see how Goethe immediately takes the story of Faust and makes it his own by fusing it with the biblical story of Job. Mephistopheles, who I want to point out, while in Marlowe's Dr. Faustus is merely an underling, a servant of Satan, in Goethe's version here he is actually the devil. Uh, he appears in heaven to quote Charlie Daniels' Faustian story in a bind because he's way behind and he's willing to make a deal. So God asks Mephistopheles if he is familiar with Faust, an immensely erudite doctor of great renown. Mephistopheles says he is, and God then urges him to try to steal his soul, betting that Faust will surprise him. And so that's what Mephistopheles decides to do. Now, the prologue also differentiates Goethe's version of the Faust story from Marlowe's in a tonal sense, because while the story of Faust is traditionally a tragedy steeped in darkness and apprehension, the tone throughout Goethe's telling is decidedly more lighthearted and kind of whimsical, as evinced by the fact that the relationship between God and the devil here is much more gentlemanly than usually depicted. It is also important to note the nature of how Goethe portrays the devil, which is distinct from the usual. The devil in Faust isn't nearly as malevolent as we normally see, but rather is self-described as the spirit that negates. The way Goethe portrays the devil is as a character wholly devoid of creative force. Rather than being able to make anything, he can only taint and ruin what already is. He may be able to conjure tricks and illusions, but the power for true creation is beyond him. Basically, he's only a naysayer, one who constantly kind of poo-poos everything but can't really offer any form of improvement of his own. This ties into one of the play's central themes, which is the relationship between godhood and the ability to create. As the first half opens, Faust sits alone in, the, in his study on the eve of Easter. Now, it's very important, by the way, and he is lamenting the fact that he has exhausted all avenues of learning, and yet he still knows so little. He contemplates suicide, but ultimately demurs. The next day, though, while walking with his acquaintance Wagner, another carryover, mind you, from Marlowe's rendition, Faust notices a black poodle following them. He takes the poodle home only for it to morph into Mephistopheles. The devil proceeds to tell him that he knows that Faust wants godlike power and knowledge and that he can give it to him, but he'll have to make a wager. Mephistopheles will serve him and allow him to have what he wishes, but if he ever becomes complacent, if he ever feels lasting satisfaction, if he ever spiritually stagnates and ceases to strive for more, then the devil gets his ass and Faust is like, you're on. This is another important way also in which Goethe's tale differs from the previous versions. Uh, Faust does not sell his soul, but rather he bets it. This way there exists an opportunity for him to get whatever he wants and achieve his desires, and yet still end up with his soul his own. Again, this telling lacks the darkness inherent in the foregone conclusion of Marlowe's. So the majority of Faust Part 1 is occupied by Faust wanting to get laid. Namely, he sets his sights on a lovely young maiden, named Margaret slash Marguerite slash Gretchen. But alas, Faust is an old man, and so Mephistopheles takes him to a witch's house where he imbibes a magic potion that restores him to youth. He then proceeds to woo Margaret, although with disastrous side effects. He inadvertently kills her mother, impregnates her, which leads to her public shame, and then accidentally kills her brother in a duel. Then, while he pisses off with Mephistopheles to ascend the Brocken, which is a mountain in Germany, on Walpurgis night, basically like Christmas for witches and whatnot, she drowns their child and is arrested and set to be executed. Faust then tries to spring her from jail, but she accepts her fate and submits herself to the judgment of a higher court. And so, part one ends with Faust parting from the woman he loves, at least then, 
with Mephistopheles. And now we come to part two, the part that most people don't read, and that is far wilder and more bizarre than the preceding, but also the part that contains the bulk of the play's thematic content. Part one is, gen is a generally intimate affair representing the microcosm, whereas part two is more grand in scale, representing the macrocosm. In part two, Faust and Mephistopheles worm their way into the court of an unnamed emperor and proceed to introduce a fiat currency into the empire's economy. Now, if you don't know what that means, a fiat currency is a term in economics denoting money that is not backed by the concrete value of gold or silver. Basically, it is currency that does not adhere to the gold standard and whose value exists solely in the minds of those who exchange it. The money that Faust and Mephistopheles introduce winds up wrecking the economy and leading to great unrest. My, that sounds familiar. Faust and Mephistopheles uh, return to his old living quarters to find that uh, Wagner has engineered a homunculus, a tiny little humanoid creature in a glass vial. See, I told you it got weird. They then zoom off to Greece with the little dude, and there ensues extended passages that I honestly couldn't make heads or tails of. Uh, eventually, though, Faust decides that he wants to romance Helen of Troy. That's another motif taken from Marlowe's play also. Uh, and so he and Mephistopheles apparently travel back in time, I guess, or something, and Faust succeeds in winning the heart of the most beautiful woman to have ever lived. However, that soon flames out when their kid dies and Faust is returned once again to the realm of the emperor from earlier, now with his sights no longer set quite so high. Faust and Mephistopheles then aid the emperor in winning a war in which he is embroiled, and Faust ends up becoming the feudal lord of a seaside kingdom. At the end of the play, Faust is an old man who rules his domain with something of an iron fist. While imagining the creation of a utopic kingdom of peace and prosperity, he feels a fleeting sensation of bliss which he states he would long to experience forever and then promptly dies. Mephistopheles tries to claim his soul only for a flock of angels to descend and bear Faust to heaven where he is reunited with Margaret. And so now we see what is undoubtedly the biggest differentiation from Goethe's, the biggest differentiation of Goethe's from Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, and that is the ending. Here, Faust is not dragged to hell like he is in the, the earlier play, but rather gets to go to heaven, much to the perplexity and chagrin of some readers. Now, two booktubers whom I greatly admire and whose content I greatly enjoy, both did reviews of Faust. They being Cliff at Better Than Food Book Reviews and Stella at It's Too Late to Apologize. Definitely check out their videos on Faust. I know I sure did before I tackled reading it. Um, but the funny thing is, is that both of them had similar reactions to the end, uh, namely feeling that it was unearned and cheap, I think. They, they even used the same expression, if I remember correctly, that Faust gets to go to heaven because, well, you tried. And I have to say, I wholeheartedly understand the issue that they took with this work's conclusion. Faust gets to go to heaven in short because he won the bet, but I'm not really so sure he did. And if he did, it's splitting some hairs. The wager was that Mephistopheles would win his soul if he ever felt a satisfaction that he would long to last forever, which is exactly what he does feel at the end of the play. I guess it's because he only feels such a sensation when imagining forward to something that he won't ever accomplish, that he technically doesn't lose the deal. I don't know, the ending was whack because basically it says that it doesn't matter what you do in life, only that you keep doing. Faust is an absolutely abominable character in this play. He actually degrades so much over the course of the story that I at least was actively wanting Mephistopheles to win because he does so many horrible things and wrecks so many lives. But no, Faust get, ascends to heaven upon dying because he still strove for something, I guess. 
I think Faust, at least the second part, is probably, if I'm being honest, one of the hardest things that I've ever read. And I didn't expect that. You know, you hear about Ulysses and Moby Dick being hard reads, but not so much about Faust. So I was unprepared by just, uh, I was unprepared for just how difficult it was. There were extended sequences where I had not a clue what was happening or didn't know the significance of what was happening when I did. As I mentioned earlier, almost the entire thing is written in rhyme, and good God did it become exhausting to read. Granted, there were some passages which were truly awe-inspiring in their grandiosity, but there were some times when I felt it was just downright stupid and ridiculous, and he was really reaching for some of those rhymes, let me tell you. However, I believe that Faust is as vaunted as it is and holds such a high place in the ranks of world literature because, like Dante's Divine Comedy, it strives to imagine the entire cosmos in relation to man, as well as the relationship between man and God. Thematically, Faust is a story concerned with limitations and boundaries and the inability of mortals to meaningfully transgress them. Faust briefly creates an idyllic, heaven-like kingdom where he is married to Helen of Troy, but it quickly comes crashing down when his son is killed due to overreaching his bounds, the very thing that Faust himself is guilty of. Afterwards, Faust lowers his sights to simply trying to improve the world around him to greater effect. He dies dreaming of perfecting his kingdom on earth and creating a utopia for his subjects, implying that the greatest bliss to which we can aspire involves improving our own spirit. The play opens with archangels opining that only God can understand all of creation and that everything has its place. Faust ultimately learns the futility of reaching beyond his grasp, but still strives for the betterment of what he is allotted. Also, Faust serves as a way for Goethe to critique Western culture as a whole, as well as some of the ideas of the Enlightenment in which he lived. There is an extolment here of classical Greek values and a decrying of some values of the modern. In particular, Goethe appears to have taken umbrage with the way that reason and passion were becoming increasingly divorced. Science in the Enlightenment era was a means for picking apart nature without appreciating its beauty. To Goethe, the ancient Greeks were laudable for being inquisitive about the world around them, but also appreciative of its grandeur and its mystery. There are jibes made in the play at the world of academia and its dry, uninspired nature of rote dissection and analysis. The world of the supernatural becomes much more alluring to Faust because it defies the sort of cold quantification of the realm of Mundus. Overall, I think Faust is probably one of the most conflicting things I've ever read. It was difficult, at times incomprehensible, and often downright exhausting. One can probably raise some serious objections about its themes and subject matter, especially the ending, and I'm undecided about how I feel about Faust as a character. On one hand, he was a total tool, but on the other, I kind of do respect Goethe for not giving us a likable protagonist. All in all, though, I think I would rate Faust an A-, minus, which is actually a notch lower than I rated Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. Goethe's Faust may have shot higher, but damn is it unwieldy as hell. But anyway, have you read Faust? If you have, let me know down in the comments what you thought about it, whether you have agreed or disagreed with anything I've said about it here today. And if you haven't read Faust, I don't know, you might like to give it a go, but be aware that it ain't any walk in the park. And as always, if you have enjoyed anything you've seen or heard here today, remember to like, subscribe, help the channel out a little bit. I would greatly appreciate it. And until next time, peace.